Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Mark Hill, professor at the University of Wisconsin, um, one of the distinguished members of the computer architecture community, a um, person I worked with for a long time, both at grad school and then at Wisconsin. And he's going to be telling us about some of the recent work that they've done, which is obviously very relevant to a lot of the interests inside Microsoft around transactional memory. Mark? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, everybody can hear me. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, last time I gave a talk at Microsoft Research, there was a snowstorm that day. <laughs> and I learned that snowstorms scare people in Seattle more than they do in Madison. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you about some work, log-based transactional memory, that the paper just got accepted uh, to appear in an architecture conference uh, two days ago. So the good news is that this work is really fresh. The bad news is that the animated examples end halfway through the talk and, and its words, but I'm sure you guys all have imaginations. But please uh, interrupt me. I love being hassled. And uh, I will try to repeat your questions so that it works for the people uh, who are listening outside this room now or later. Let's see. OK, so uh, first I'll give you a sort of an abstract for the talk. So there's all these people talking about transactional memory. I'm going to talk mostly about hardware transactional memory, which means there's stuff happening at the low level in, in the hardware, like the cache coherence protocol. Most of the ones that are out there uh, use what we call deferred version management, which means that when you do a transaction, you've got some new tentative values that you have to keep if you commit, and some old values that you have to restore if you abort. So where do you put these things? Most of them store the old values in place, and they put the new values sort of on the side somewhere to put uh, in place if you have a commit. Uh, and this makes commits slower than aborts, but co commits are more common. So uh, since we learned from AMDAL you want to make the common case fast, let's try to make the common case faster. <coughs> and so what we're proposing is basically to take a page from um, conservative concurrency control database management systems and use a log. So we're going to store the old values in a log in fed private virtual memory. We'll put the new values in place. And um, if all goes well, we can commit very quickly. Uh, aborts, however, are slower. And then there's some other results dealing with uh, cache overflow and software abort handling. So that's sort of the abstract. Uh, and so what I'll do is talk a little bit about motivation and then go into log TM in detail. We'll talk about some preliminary results, some future directions, and as time permits, um, some um, things about what, what the project is doing in general. So like, have there been a bunch of transactional memory talks, Jim? Mm -hmm. uh, not hardware ones. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Um, all right, so I guess I'll, we'll just do this quickly then. So chip multiprocessors are coming, perhaps you've heard. And it's going to make multi-threaded programming more important. You can do this now with locks. Locks are hard. Um, Coarse grain locking actually is not that hard, but you don't get very good performance. Fine grain locking can be very difficult. There's all these issues with priority inversion and composition challenges, which uh, others know better than I. I just know that when you assign small programs with locks, grad computer science PhD students don't have too much trouble with it. But if you make them do big programs, they have trouble. And if you give it to uh, the morts of the world, it's going to be a problem. So there's this new idea that's it's not that new. The original paper was 1993, but it's been reinvigorized by chip multiprocessing, which is transactional memory. And so this is totally different than database transactions. This is at a much uh, more memory level, much faster. It's trying to replace sequences of, of tens, hundreds, who knows, maybe thousands of instructions. Uh, and we're going to somehow automatically create the illusion that you can say begin transaction, just make it atomic, and end transaction. And the software deals with it. And there are approaches for doing it completely in software, which are making great strides. And I'm going to talk about the, the hardware approaches more. But we can take some questions about the software approaches if you want. 
Okay, so why are we dealing with hardware transactional memory? Well, the thing is, is that uh, when it works, it can be really fast. Uh, it can be faster than the software transactional memories, in part because you can do transactions in parallel except when there are conflicts. When are there conflicts? Well, that's when somebody's trying to write something that you're reading. Well, it turns out cache coherence protocols that are already in the hardware do almost what you want to do all this detection automatically. So we're going to leverage that somehow, and this can save us a lot of the in, in directions and copying that software transactional memory systems have to do. So you get faster speed. You also can get speed very relative to locks. You can write your transaction on a coarse grain and effectively get sort of fine grain locking. And in fact, the performance can sometimes be better than locks because you don't even have to, you can actually have parallel critical sections if that isn't an oxymoron. I'll show you that later. Uh, and you have to remember, nobody is going to Thread level parallelism because it makes the programming easier. So the only reason for doing this is that it can go faster. So we have to go fast, otherwise this is not worth it. And we'll say, however, that hardware virtual memory does have some serious issues. I mean, software virtual mem transactional memory, not virtual memory. Software transactional memory has the problem is that it's not very fast yet. Maybe it will be someday. Hardware virtual memory, hardware transactional memory has virtualization issues. We're playing games down there with the hardware with things like processors and caches, and programmers like to reason about threads and memory. Okay, and so we're working, we actually have making some progress on dealing with limits and caches and associativities, but sort of more work needs to sort of generalize to handle uh, paging and process switching and things like that. It's a big question whether or not anyone is wants to use transactions say that has to, have to live past uh, time slices and things like that. Uh, but uh, we need to make it at least work correctly. <coughs> okay? So, how, so there's, a, there's several propos hardware proposals out there. I'll, I'll give you some names later. But I, we're trying to develop a taxonomy for reasoning about them. And of course, this taxonomy is a, a little bit of an oversimplification. But it does shed some light on differences. So one difference is this data version, version management. Right? As I said before, you have to keep the old values uh, uh, that you're modifying in the transaction in case you have to abort. You have to save the new values, obviously, if you want to commit. Where do you keep them? We're going to call it eager if we put the old values elsewhere and new values in place, you know, betting that you're going to commit, and deferred if you do the converse, updating elsewhere and putting the old leaving the old values in place. Um, and this give, the eager gives you faster commit. Okay, another dimension is that you have to do conflict detection. You have to detect whether two or more transactions are accessing the same data, or at least one of them is writing that. And you can do this either eager or deferred. <coughs> eager is you do it just as the transactions are trying to read write the data, and deferred is where you do it later when you're trying to commit and might find that you have to abort. Any questions on this sort of distinction? Okay. Um, so the nice thing about eager is that, uh, well, eager conflict detection allows, you know, earlier conflict detection allows for earlier conflict resolution. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of proposed systems out there that we can now um, distinguish in part by these two features. So here we have. Uh, conflict detection, deferred or eager, and the version management, deferred or eager. So a lot of the proposals fit into this box here. So here's Hurley's and Moss's first proposal at circa 93. Um, and here are some others, which I won't go into. Uh, but what about some of these other quadrants? Okay, well one interesting quadrant is to go up here. So this is where you're doing everything deferred, okay? And this is what database management systems that use optimistic concurrency control uh, would do. And so you could apply this idea um, to transactional memory. In fact, there's a big effort to do this. And I understand Kazarakis gave a talk on it. So this is Stanford's uh, transactional consistency and coherence or coherence and consistency. OK, what about other quadrants? Well, it's not clear. Nothing's been done in this quadrant. It's not clear it makes sense. Uh, the quadrant we're interested in is this one here. This is the quadrant where almost all successful commercial databases sit. 
right, where they, they do both things eager. They detect conflicts as soon as you try to uh, read or write data, usually with locks. And um, they are playing this game where they're putting the new values in place, betting on things. Now, there's at least one hardware proposal for doing that out of MIT, um, but it was so complicated that in their same paper, they switched over to this proposal and evaluated this proposal. Um, so I don't think that's a vote of confidence for the design. Uh, and that's the quadrant where I'm going to make our proposal. OK, so we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. It's called log TM. I learned, though, every time you try to do like TM in uh, PowerPoint, it's thinks you're trying to do trademark and makes it a superscript and stuff like that. And so we're going to go into the version management. This is going to take a long time. And don't get worried that if, after we've done this, then I'm going to take equally long in the others. They're going to be shorter. OK, so eager version management right, is where you're going to put the old values somewhere else and the new values in place. So where are we going to put the old values? Um, we're going to put the old values in a transaction log. Okay, and this transaction log is a per thread linear virtual address space that's associated with a thread. So think of this as you got P threads and you allocated space for your stack, you're also going to allocate space for your log. Okay, and even though it's in hardware shared memory, the log is, uh, at least now, no one else is going to read or write it. Okay, and we're going to propose some hardware that when you're doing a transaction is going to sort of automatically uh, fill this log. And then when there's an abort, there's a way we're going to trap the software, and then software will undo, the, a, a low-level trap handler will undo the log. OK, so let's, uh, and what's a good, why is this a good idea? Well, this can allow for very fast commits. It does require some hardware support. And let's go into a, a more detailed example. OK, so I'm going to explain this picture, because it's going to go on for a little bit. And so this is the view of one thread of its virtual address space, which includes some data, including three blocks, yellow, blue, and green. And logically associated with these blocks are going to be a couple bits, R and W, which stand for read and write, which are going to be used to detect conflicts. Okay, And then you've also allocated this space in your virtual address space for the log. And you have, just like a stack, you have a base and you have a pointer to the end that are pointing to each other right now because it's empty. And then logically, you're going to be in a transaction or not in a transaction. And since this is 0, you're not in a transaction. OK, so how does this work? So uh, we come along and we want to begin a transaction. OK, and so how much work is it going to take to begin a transaction? Um, software transactional memory systems sometimes have to do a lot of work. For our, in our case, it's going to be very easy. So what's going to happen here in all these slides is that we're going to put a, a, a red circle around something to indicate that this is going to change, and then we're going to change it just to draw your eye to it. So all we have to do to start a transaction is to um, set the transaction mode to 1. Is the transaction mode a Boolean value, or is it actually an integer? Uh, yeah, smart guy with the tough questions. So uh, under the, in the current design, it's actually an integer because we allow <coughs> nested transactions, but we flatten them. And so it's basically just counting the number of begins so you can match the number of ends before you go out. Under development for ISCA it will be real nested transactions. Since we're not really doing real nested transactions, I'm just treating it as Boolean in this example. But you get an A. <laughs> OK, so very fast. All right, so now let's say what we want to do is a load. We're going to do a load to the yellow block. And we're going to hopefully get the value 12. We're loading the, the first word in the block. Uh, all we have to do to perform the load is we go to these, these logical read-write bits, which are actually going to be implemented with hardware in the cache. And we're going to set the read bit to 1. OK, and that's it. Furthermore, if this transaction does more load to this block, no action is needed for the same word or other words in this data block. The data block is, you know, well, it will be implemented as a cache block. So think 
64 bytes, 128 bytes, that sort of size. Okay, so we want to do a store. Well, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a store to the first word of the green block, and we're going to run and write 56 into it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is go to these read and write bits, and it shouldn't shock you that we're going to set the write bit to 1. Okay, now we're going to go over to this log. And we are going to copy the address, the virtual address of the green block, as well as the current old data of the green block into the log. And then, of course, increment the log pointer to point to the end uh, where the next empty location is, and then, then perform the store. Now, this may look slow, but there's various hardware and buffers and tricks where we think we can actually make this pretty fast. Okay. And furthermore, if there's any more stores to this block, uh, no more logging is needed. You just perform the store uh, directly. Are there any questions about that one? That's, yeah. Well, you're, I take you're going to say, tell me what's going to happen if you have different across the uh, I mean, you can't get yes. one bit. I, I presume it's cached along with that process. time out. So first of all, uh, <laughs> A little bit hand-waved was the fact that this bit is logically associated with this thread. So it's not really, it's not only associated with this block, but it's also associated with this thread. And so I'm going to go through a series of examples where nothing else is happening, so it doesn't matter. And then we're going to deal with the fact that if somebody else tries to access something where there's a conflict, then we're going to have to trigger some actions. So your question was? Well, my comment was that these are, are caches, uh, like the VHL message model. This already has exclusive access for the cache. So. Well, you're ahead of me. Uh, I'm going to, a couple slides later, we're going to show how the coherence protocol, the standard coherence protocol is pretty close to what we need, and we just add a little. And that's the beauty of the hardware transactional memory systems. Um, OK, so that's a, a, a like store. Yep. Right. Uh, I mean, logically. The well, this was just an this was just an example that did a store only to keep it simple. Uh, if you want to do a load before a store, you could do uh, this example right here. So here's where we're going to go to the blue block and we're going to load it first, uh, as is commonly done, increment it, and then store it back. Okay, and. Uh, <coughs> The same thing happens. We just log it in there. And then we do the store, and voila, we're done. So in the common case, you're absolutely right. Most words are uh, loaded before they're stored. We don't require that, uh, but when that happens, these two bits are set. And it turns out, in, in a hard, some hardware that we're not necessarily going to cover, if it's loaded before it stores, that's actually good for us. Because we have to read it out of the cache to store it into the log. Boy, it's kind of nice if it was read anyway. And we'll, I'll show you some data where it's, it's almost always read before it's written, which I, I, doesn't surprise you guys. Yeah? In the previous write example with C0, if that cache line wasn't resident, you bring it in and you copy it to the log, but you'd only set the write bit on it. Yes. Yes? Do you need to scale oh. the size of the caches as you do this extra work so that you avoid more cache conflicts between your program values? Oh, so, so the question, I forgot, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <coughs> so do you need to scale the caches to allow for this humongous log? Uh, well, first of all, um, we're going to have some innovation layer that's going to allow a little bit of cache replacement. So we're not sort of dead if you exceed the cache a little bit. The log, it doesn't, it's only a performance thing whether it's in the cache. What's a big debate is when people actually start using this stuff, how big are these transactions going to be? This is like totally unknown. Okay? But I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them are kind of small, right? You're doing 10 cache blocks. And so this log is almost always going to be in cache and, it, and it's not going to generate very much conflict. The reason it's going to be in cache is not shown yet, when this commits and then later on you do another transaction, your log starts in the same place. So those cache blocks are already there. Yes, Jim? Why, why do you think it's only going to be 10 
cash block. Well, so this is part of what is currently unknown. Are transactions just a replacement for double compare and swap, or the replacement for you know running for a quarter of a second? Okay, and uh, right now the hardware schemes are better if they're the former, and we're trying to move it toward the latter. But I think it's still unknown if, if people really want to use transactions for a quarter of a second, including frequent context switches and process migrations, how to do this without introducing so much mechanism that the whole thing sinks. <clears throat> I guess I should be a better salesman, huh? OK, so. Um, we did our, uh, our manipulation, and now let's say we want to commit the transaction, because that's all we want to do. How long does commit take? Well, the good news, right, is that we have the new values completely in place. So to commit, we go to these read-write bits, and we have a hardware implementation that can just flash clear them all, sort of one cycle, two cycles, not proportional to the number of bits that are set. OK, and then all we have to do then is reset the uh, log pointer and clear the transaction mode. OK, all of which can be done. This is just copying uh, the base register back into the log pointer. So we can do a commit in essentially uh, constant, small constant time, like one cycle, three cycles. So that's our fast commit. Questions on that? Yep. Uh, I, I don't understand how you could have constant time for your read-write bits. Uh, assume that it takes several megabytes of space. I might have a transaction that touches many gigabytes. Okay. So, um, so in the initial designs, we're doing the read-write bits primarily in the L1 cache, which is of order 64k bytes, not your megabytes. And, and, it's, and it's easy to build a circuit which essentially says, in this column, every, every block, zap yourself. Okay. If we want to do this for an L2 cache, which would get you to uh, megabytes, then such a circuit is uh, possible, but a little power hungry, and maybe some innovation is needed. Um, Currently, we have a solution that also works reasonably well if you replace a few blocks. You know, like you happen to have bad luck on your associativity or something like that. Uh, if instead you're saying that it is the norm that you replace from the cache, then uh, more innovation is needed. This, these designs, all the hardware designs except at MIT UTM, are really assuming that the norm is, is that it fits in the cache. And that's really something, that's why it's research, right? Yeah. Or Madhu. These are small. One of my fine PhD students, by the way. That's why I <laughs> um, so You're trying to get me back for your defense, right? Go ahead, so sorry. For, so can I view this as, as, I don't have to use a lock when I'm traversing a list, which is rarely inserted into, so I don't want to use locks for that purpose, but the list can be pretty long. Is that the valid use for these things? Yes, so, so the question was, if you're doing this big insertion to the list. Yeah, so it's things like a hash table is a good example. You can just have a big lock over the whole hash table, and if it tends to be that concurrent axes are manipulating different elements, there'll never be a conflict, and you'll sort of get the performance of fine grain locking with the programming effort of coarse grain locking. With uh, you know data structures like doubly linked lists, I mean, Hurley, he has this uh, DQ paper it's a publishable result to implement you know, uh, obstruction-free insertion to both ends of a DQ with compare and swap. Well, it's not a publishable lock with transactional memory. You just do transactions, and if two people are manipulating the same end of the queue at the same time, you know, they conflict. Need a better answer? Yeah, so the thing we would want to do is in some place do in-place modification that I can work on that item for a little bit of time. So that I don't really want to DQ and NQ back or something, right? It's time is not a problem for us. I mean, we're the, well, the, the main problem is the number of blocks touched specifically and, and the number of blocks written. Time, 
I guess only matters is that you're vulnerable to, I mean, if somebody else wants to manipulate the same data, there's no magic here. Somebody has to abort, somebody has to wait. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's not really a programming talk. I thought that people had seen the programming enough. So I didn't do any examples. OK, so this is the good case. This is a commit. It was very fast. Uh, alternative is that uh, we're going to go back to the case where we just done, you know, fast, go back a slide, right, where we had done the three operations. And before we had a chance to commit, there was a conflict. And we're going to explain exactly how conflicts work later. But let's say this conflict makes it so that it decides that we need to abort. OK? And by design, aborts take more work than, um, um, than commits. So what are we going to do to abort? OK, uh, I bounce there. OK, so what, first thing we're going to do, I guess it bounced really quickly there. We're going to start unrolling the log. So there was a 24 there. Um, so we copy this back there, and then we change the log pointer to remove it from the log. Okay, and now we're going to copy the green block's old value back, and then we're going to remove it from the log. Okay, now we're going to clash, clash clear the bits, and then we're going to reset the transactional mode, and that finishes the abort. Okay, so the abort time is indeed proportional to the uh, the number of blocks that you modified, independent of the number of blocks you read. Yes? So minor optimization would be cleared by right bits as you were, as you were replaying or undoing the log? Uh-huh. So yeah, you could clear the right bits as you're undoing the log if you're sure that something is not logged twice. OK? And in the simple example, we would not be so stupid as to log something twice. But it turns out that if we have a cache replacement and it comes back, there's a case where we might log it twice. Yep. So what does the consistency model that the rest of the system sees while you're unrolling this? Well, the rest of the system doesn't see anything, especially if I clear these bits at the end. It sees, you know, you know basically it's unavailable. The blocks are unavailable while okay. this guy seems to be being slow. Because this is a uh, this is thread private, you know you could you can cheat and look at it, but you're not supposed to. And these bits are still that's why we cleared them last. And we should look, by the way, actually at clearing them faster. I guess when we're sure it's not double entered. And there are times we can be sure it was not double entered because we can easily keep track of whether there was any overflow from the cache. Because in many cases there won't be any overflow. Yep. So the hardware actually does the rollback? Uh, so uh, in an innovation which I'm going to describe, hardware is not going to do the rollback. But, oh, well, yes. actually, uh, down here. so you could do the rollback in hardware or software. Our, our, our primary design is we're actually going to trap and do it in low-level software. Uh, we also believe that there's probably a lot of merit in having a hardware acceleration so that hardware <laughs> does the rollback for a small number of blocks that you can buffer easily. But hardware does the logging. Hardware does the logging. Yeah, so you have a, some structures in your cache that, that do this. Yes? So if you're doing it software, you cannot have the trans transaction mode bit set while you're doing it, can you? Well, your, your software is running on your processor. So yes, you can. Well, there's issues to be worked out on exactly what the handler does. Uh, but this is running on this processor. So this is a matter of this, this thread, in effect, saying, I want to, you know, I've already written this thing, and I want to you know, write it again. Just coincidentally, I'm writing the value that it had prior to the transaction. Okay. Um, there are some issues later on if we ever want someone else to allow to roll you back for some reason, some conflict uh, management reasons. And then they'll require some mechanisms for doing the right, even in the presence of this bit saying that you shouldn't do it. This is all user level, by the way, and so if we want, you know, at some level we can say, user, you want to screw yourself up, you are allowed to do that. Yes? What happens when the thread crashes in the middle of 
When the thread crashes in the middle, you crash. We are not doing anything about durability or anything right now. So, but if they, if they, if they started a transaction, they got the the other threads don't get seeded. There's do they touch the, the memory blocks? And well, the correct answer, I, has, I haven't really thought about it because that hasn't been a focus. I think you're in pretty, well, I guess if a thread crashes somehow but you believe it has not corrupted its log, you could develop a mechanism where somebody else undoes the log to restore things to the pre-transaction state. But one of the disadvantages of this scheme is that aborts are slower. And so if you want to abort somebody because of a crash or something, it, it does take effort. This is not all worked out. This is just the first paper. Yes? Have you compared with the people doing, doing uh, uh, registry naming in, in modern CPUs, especially Intel architecture? Because it sounds remarkably similar to what you're doing. So the question is, have we compared to people doing register renaming? Um, we haven't, I mean, you're right at, a, at a many levels. It's, this is memory renaming of a sort. Um, I'll have to think about that more. I'll, I'll show you later with the cache coherence protocol, and you'll see how it's, you know, it's using. That's one thing it's very close to as well. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, so what's going on here? Well, the advantage is that we're doing uh, fast commits, hardware flash clear. There's no copying. There's no indirection, and hopefully this is common, so it can be very fast. Um, on the other hand, our aborts are slower. You have to undo the log. We currently trap to a handler, which does the undo. Uh, and hopefully this is uncommon. And the reason we're trapping is that, especially later on, we want to do smarter things in this handler. You can do it. We're hopefully doing a full-blown conflict manager, a la Michael Scott and others. OK, so what I've done now is this is log-based transactional memory. And we did the long example on the eager version management. Unfortunately, we don't have beautiful animated slides yet for this other stuff, uh, so it will go faster, but with, perhaps with less clarity. OK, so what we're going to do next is this eager conflict detection, including how we candle, handle cache overflow. <coughs> all right, so first of all, most hardware transactional memory systems do eager conflict detection. So that's at reads and writes, you do something. And they leverage right back uh, somebody called messy cache coherence. Uh, FYI, Stanford TCC does neither. OK, so first of all, we got a half slide here on standard coherence. OK, so standard coherence on every memory block, um, you have a number of states. And most important here, we allow either one writer, state M or modified, or multiple readers, state S or shared. OK, and it's a protocol's job to detect and order data conflicts. So if one processor is, at least one processor is just trying to write the block. OK, so for example, if a processor wants to write a block, it has to obtain an M co copy. And in the process, it will invalidate the existing S copies. And that's what standard coherence does. So it sounds pretty similar to what we want to do for, um, for transaction conflict detection. And that's exactly why people want to leverage it. OK, and so the basic idea is that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to add, for each block at each processor, logically a write bit and a read bit. And this is going to say whether or not this particular transaction has touched these blocks, or the, as opposed to that you touch the blocks outside of a transaction. And to make it work with the coherence protocol, we are going to require, as somebody was hinting at, that if you set the W bit, you can't set the W bit unless you get the block in the M state first. And you can't set the R bit, R bit unless you get it in the S state or the M state or the O and the E, if you know what those are. And so what this is, the reason you have this restriction on the coherence states is so that this makes sure that the coherence protocol doing its normal thing will help you detect your data conflicts. Right? So for example, if you want a transactional writer wants to get an M copy to set the W bit, it's going to have to seek those S copies. And if it finds that one of those S copies has the R bit set, lo and behold, you have detected a conflict. Any questions? This is not particular to us. This is all the transactional memory systems um, with TCC doing it a little differently. Any questions on that? 
Okay, so we basically apply this to directory coherence with a little bit of difference. So the key thing is that we're going to detect the conflict. We're going to have a directory, which is you know, something logically at memory that keeps track of where copies are. So if you're a requesting processor, you'll issue the coherence request. It'll go to the directory. The directory keeps track of who has it. It'll forward it to those processors. Those processors will then look the block up and say, oh my god, you know, the, uh, the R bit is set. And then it's going to actually inform the original requester that the R bit is set. The processor that detects the conflict is not going to try to do some action. And this is really important. Some of the designs do that, but we realize that this detecting processor, like it might be in the operating system right now, because it didn't know this conflict was coming in. Whereas you know that the, re the requesting processor was definitely in user mode in this transaction, because otherwise this request wouldn't be out there. So we're going to direct this, uh, we're going to detect this, and then we're going to send it back to the requesting processor to resolve it, which is going to be aborting and, or waiting, which I'll discuss later. Uh, so any questions about the basic idea of using coherence to detect conflicts? This is in the absence of cache replacement. This, this inform is part of the normal cache code and saying you don't get access, or this is a new message that you're sending back? OK, so uh, Madhu asks, uh, so well, how does this work with the coherence protocol mark your hand waving? Um, so actually, the way it works with the coherence protocol is the coherence protocol sends back a knack, saying, yeah, I looked this all up for you, but there's a conflict here. And then based on that knack, your hardware can do something. Yep. So if there's a conflict, you could, you could either abort the, the one that uh, seeks the game bit or the one that has the, uh, the art bit. Um, Say again, why do you choose to abort the requesting one rather than the other one? Well, I'm, I was hoping to talk about resolving the conflict later. Okay. All right, fine. Let's do it later. Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll actually give you a little answer. So one of the problems is the is I'm going to say this. A the pro, one problem is that the processor that detects the conflict. Who knows what they're doing? Maybe they have just called the operating system. Okay, they, they had this transactional data left around. Well, let's, I'm going to leave it to later. Good question, though. So, but and it's, it's important, and a lot of people confuse detecting from resolving. Okay, so before we do that, well, all right, so there's, there's going to require some hardware state. What time am I supposed to finish by, Jim? Um. Okay, I won't be that late. All right, so what, what does this actually take to implement this? It actually takes these read write bits are literally in the cache, um, and these registers are just simple sort of control registers. Now, one other thing about our current design is that when we start a transaction, we logically take a register checkpoint so that when there's an abort, the abort handler can actually restore that checkpoint, and you can go back to that point sort of almost completely transparent to the software. Now, actually, it remains to be seen whether this is the right thing to do, or with right compiler support, you could be much smarter. But Jim left Wisconsin, so. OK, so one of the real problems with, with some of the previous schemes, like Hurley's, was that it you know, Hurley's had like a 16 entry buffer for doing your transactions. And if you exceeded that buffer, which actually had some old and new values, so you couldn't even just touch 16 blocks, you couldn't touch like eight, too bad, you're boarded, not possible, can't do it. Okay, and sort of solutions that put hardware limits to software um, are not great. And <laughs> not only that, is it's not just the cache size, it's also the associativity. So if you have a four-way set associative cache and your transaction innocently writes five blocks, you'd be sure you're OK. But if you had the bad luck that they all map to the same set, you would get an overflow. And so we wanted to make sure that um, we could do something, um, we could handle overflows more gracefully. Now some of these schemes have some solutions, but for reasons which I won't get into, they all have solutions have some very d big disadvantages. And we think ours is better. Um, 
if this was a hardware group, I would go into it a lot more. Okay, so the basic idea here is we're in transaction mode, and for whatever reason, we decide we have to victimize one of these blocks where we have, let's say, the right bit set. Okay, and so this is bad because the right bit is really only in the cache, so if it's victimized, it's only in our cache too. Don't you forget what's going on, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually set an overflow bit in this processor which says sort of warning, something has been replaced, and we're actually going to allow the write back. Uh, and previously the directory, this is from processor P, uh, previously the directory would have said, hey, processor P has the block in M, and when we write it back, we're going to write it back in a special state which we call sticky M at P. And all that means basically is that, well, it overflowed in transactional mode from processor P, but now I, the memory, have the correct data. But we better ask P to, to make sure. Okay? Um, and that's all that happens on replacement. Now, in the common case, what happens is, we hope, um, you get next to the transaction end, where you're committing or aborting. Okay? And at that point, you reset your overflow bit because you're all done. And notice, we're going to commit, actually, without really cleaning up this state because we don't want to walk all these states. Well, more importantly, where are we going to remember this state, right? Because <laughs> you, you, could, you could, in principle, replace an unbounded number of items. So we're not going to clean it up. We're just going to be lazy about it. So lazy is good sometimes. Uh, but what's the problem with lazy? The problem is that much later, uh, you could get a, another processor making a potentially conflicting request for the same block. And um, it encounters the sticky M at P. And so what, what I'll do is that it'll, it'll forward, it'll send the data back to Q, but then it'll forward the request to P saying, hey, what about this overflow? Okay. And in what we expect to be the common case, P will say, what overflow? I, my overflow is not set, so um, forget it. Just the data's fine. Okay. However, uh, there's also a chance that uh, the overflow is set. Okay, and there's actually two reasons that the overflow could be set. One is you're actually still in this transaction and you did overflow and this really should be a, a conflict, in which case we'll properly indicate that. And the other is, is that you left that transaction, you went into another transaction, and that transaction, the second transaction, also overflowed. Okay, and then in that case we're going to detect a conflict and that would be, a, that'll be a false positive though. So this can be an elegant solution if uh, overflows are relatively rare. If you start, they're common, it's not going to work. Yep? You only talk about sticky M, but what about sticky S? All right. So some guy who took Red Hennessy and Patterson, huh? Uh, so S works similarly. It's not that hard. So, um, so what happens for most of these protocols is that the directory keeps track of the shares, and we're doing what's commonly done. It's called a non-notifying protocol which says that when you replace your S copy, you don't tell the directory anything. So the directory sort of still thinks you have a copy. And so if somebody comes along to try to write the data, the directory will include you in the processors that need to be contacted, giving you an opportunity to say, hey, um, I don't have it, but I'm in state overflow, so you can't trust it. If we know where it is, so the, the question was, if all the processors clear the overflow, can we get rid of the sticky state? See, one of the real problems is it's really hard to do something at cache victimization time. So in some sense, at ca when we decide to victimize somebody, you want me to also remember we replaced this block in this processor. Well, how do we do that? If we try to write something, well, that could cause a cache miss, and you get the circular dependency and deadlock. And um, VTM actually has this problem. And we, you know, so you could, you, if, if this was important, you could obviously have a, some 16 hardware registers. Remember the, the 16 cache replacements, but any fixed size thing is going to eventually reach a point where you can't do it. Yep. Sufficient if every time you clear the overflow bit at the end of the transaction, you had some way of asking, asking the directory to remove all entries that say sticky something at P? Uh, so the question was, when you cleared your overflow bit, if you had some way of telling the directory, in fact, there's, there's many directories for different memory blocks, you told them you can, all, you can clear all the sticky M's at P's. 
that, that's if you could that's, do that, it's just hard to implement. If you could do that, that'd be a great thing. Um, we can't really implement that. I don't know how to implement that. It's the right thing to say. I can imagine having a cache where I remember the top k blocks, but we still have this worst. So we can keep doing things to push off the worst case, but this design still has a worst case. And there may be better designs that don't have a worst case. Yes, Jim. I'm missing something. How does the sticky M and the entry ever get cleared? It gets cleared when somebody uh, tries to make a request like Q makes a request and it comes over to P and P says, I'm not in an overflow transaction right now. So uh, just kidding, the, the data is actually fine. So it's cleared on demand if C is not in the And so it's called lazy clearing. So if, so as you say, if you stay in the overflow situation, then your cash is gradually going to become contaminated with entries that are I mean, well, your, your the, mem the memory is. Yes, so this is not a solution. This is not, the intent of this solution is to gracefully handle a few overflows. A different solution is probably needed if overflows are common. Many overflows are common. I never thought that this would be the slide that generated all the interest. This, by the way, this was one of our innovations, though. Um, but I didn't think it was the most Microsoft research interesting innovation. All right, so here's our interface. Uh, this, was, this doesn't look too complicated, right? Uh, and uh, the thing is then is in this board handler then, uh, I mean, for the system library level, you have sort of in your P threads init, you're going to say, hey, here's my, uh, here's the virtual memory I'm using for the log, and here's the handler I want you to call when there's a problem. And then the handler can in turn do these low level hardware calls, sort of the HAL or HAT layer. So, so Mark, I'd like to your comment about why you're surprised that Microsoft Research has so many questions about it. So we have two concerns. Our first concern is that things are going to overflow all the time. The second concern is being independent of the particular hardware implementation, being correct in the face of different hardware implementations with different cache sizes. So that's why you got so many questions about the overflows that we're worried about. What happens to the system when you know somebody revs the processor and comes out with something where the cache is twice as big? Does do all your old programs? You know they probably would work better, but suppose you run it now on an older processor, they're going to stop working. Okay, sorry, I should not be so flippant. Um, all right, so um, that's a that's a legitimate concern. Uh, this is a lot like this overflow mechanism is a lot like paging right now, right? Yeah. It's like. It's there, it completes the abstraction, but please don't use it. <laughs> and, and it'll be a problem if every different hardware has a wart like this that's in a different way. Uh, and so we still need some smoothing off of these performance cliffs. Well, what you need is some way of basically saying, yes, you know there's an overflow that happens, but that we can then go back and say that if this piece of memory or something that's in a bad state now, because nobody else will be able to really write to it or be able to update it, because everybody says it's always in a, in a transaction, or if you get an answer, you get a wrong answer, right? So you'd be able to come back and from the side, go back and clean it up. Right? Well, right now, by the way, we're completely safe. We never get the wrong answer. There's some issue with too many false positives. Uh, there is a question whether you get an answer at all if, if it overflows too much. So. No, I said safe, didn't I? Safe means I don't have to get an answer, right, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't believe in partial correctness around here. Um, it's like well, actually, but, but there's now this great new term, I love it, called it obstruction freedom. Right? It's a fancy way of saying you just got to get it right when there's no contention. If there's no contention, then it's the software's problem. <laughs> I can't believe Hurley came up with this. It's godsend. No, but, but we're better than that right now. Okay. Is there any reason why you can't sort of change the directory abstraction so that we can possibly go through the directory and when you're done with the transaction that you knew had a conflict of interest and say, okay, I'm going to clear all the directory entries from my processor? Well, current implementations of directories are, you know, have sort of a location for every block in physical memory. So a solution that walks through the four gigabytes is non-ideal. But, we're so but I'm, I'm actually, I'm sensing, I'm sensing wonderful pushback here, and I will 
I will take that back as a research item that we should look for something that handles not just the, you know, the, the occasional overflows, but handles it uh, more gracefully when there's a bunch of overflow. You're, you're willing for it to be slower, I hope. So you want it to be more like a TLB miss and not a page fault. Yeah. So okay. I, you probably can't afford to put this in the directory, but you could have a version of it. So whenever you had an overflow, you had a version on it and what have you. That would allow you to, uh, again, have something that ran in the background in the directory and cleared out entries. It did not have to happen eagerly, as in whenever you finish the transaction, you could run and basically as a full processor. So, so the suggestion was if we had a version number, we could detect you know, that uh, you know, processor P was no longer on version 3, so this is totally bogus. And it turns out we have thought about that. One of the problems is that uh, in hardware, it's going to be expensive to have anything but a very short version number, like three bits. And then, of course, you're still going to have false conflicts. You've just reduced them by a factor of eight. But that might be enough. OK, well. Because now you have a good chance of you know, the people, other processors coming along and, and getting an opportunity to clear out those bits for you um, on demand. Okay. If, if, you, if the factor is one, if, if, if you're kind of in this overflow state where all the, all the, everybody's overflowing all the time, you'll never get so to So is one bit enough, red, black? Probably a good start. Okay. All <laughs> right. Out of 100%. Good pushback. Any more uh, coherence protocol design suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> so you're not ready to find it, so that's okay. So, and this part you were talking about processors. Earlier, we were talking about threads. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that it's proper to run more than one thread on the processor. Okay, so uh, let me defer that question to later, but I have to warn you, my answer is not good yet. So but that, that's exact. Remember, I told you at the beginning, a problem with the hardware virtual memory systems is that the virtualization is not that good yet. Yes. I have kind of the same question with regards to migrating threads to different processors. Okay, I'll, I'll defer that one too. Uh, but I don't have. A, I, I got to warn you. I don't have a good answer. Uh, yes. Okay, so now you got to detect the conflict, okay, and then you have to resolve it, right? And res you can resolve a conflict by waiting, but if you're dumb about waiting, you can have circular waiting and get deadlock, or you can abort, and if you just abort too quickly, you can get live lock. Uh, and there's a question in general whether you abort at the, the new requester or the responding processor that noted. That, uh, that there was a problem. And as I said before, but there were some questions on, we're going to resolve this at the requesting processor. So the responding processor is going to send back the requesting processor basically a negative acknowledgment. And then it's up to the requesting processor what to do. We do that because the responding processor, who knows where they are? It could be in some operating system S break or something. And it's just not a good time to respond. Now, what does the requesting processor do? Well. Uh, under the current design, and I'll do futures right here, um, is that what we try to do, actually, we find that it actually does pretty good to try to wait a little bit. Uh, but there's a problem if you wait. Uh, and one of the ways we fix that problem is, is that there's, we have another bit where we can say whether or not the processor we're waiting on is waiting. Because if the processor that we're waiting on is not waiting, then there can't be deadlock. And waiting in our situation seems to work better. If they are waiting, then there's some issue, and we have some timestamps, which I don't want to talk about because I'm crusading to get rid of them because I don't like this much mechanism in hardware. In the future, what our plan is to do is to basically say, well, the requesting processor gets notified of the conflict. It takes the trap, but then it calls a contention manager using some kind of an open nested transaction or something. And the contention manager decides who aborts. So the requesting processor does not necessarily abort. It just does the work to invoke uh, who does it. I don't want any questions on that because I'm bluffing. <laughs> Sounds like, yeah, what those harder guys? The software. But isn't that what you want? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I mean, we read this paper by Michael Scott, and he, he asked the question, what's the best contention manager policy? And the answer is, it depends. OK. Operating system interaction. This ought to be a short slide. OK, so the first, I should say that our story is better 
than the story of many previous hardware transactional memory systems. But our story is still not that good. Okay? So first of all, our transactions are user level thingies. The logs are only this processes, all the threads of this process, your, it's only your own data. It's got virtual addresses, not physical addresses. Uh, and uh, you never stall conflict or bort on OS or other processors' data. This is assuming, of course, you're not doing something like System 5 shared memory, which we're not handling. We do not, uh, you know, require, okay, I'll stop. Yes? So does that mean you have some way to turn off the transaction while you're going into the kernel, or are you assuming that the transaction never expanded the kernel? Let me go further down in the slide to answer that. Okay, so, so can we handle system calls in a transaction, you might ask. Most other people cannot handle them at all. We can handle them this much. Okay, we can handle two right now. <laughs> That's a start. Okay, so if you're doing, your transaction is doing a user level malloc and the user level malloc uh, traps and does an S break call, you can handle that. Why can you handle that? And it's an easy case because you actually don't have to undo the S break. Even if the malloc aborts, you go back to the beginning and then you may or may not try to malloc again, but even if you do, it's kind of nice the S break's already done. And we also handle Spark register window under and overflows, principally because they should have been user level traps anyway. I don't, uh, Mark, I don't understand. How do you, how do you undo a call to malloc that completed successfully and later on there was a conflict? <clears throat> okay, so first of all, we're not doing open nested transactions yet. So this, if you do a call to malloc, this is in basically a flattened big transaction. So you allocated this, but everything, all the pointers that you manipulated are locked. Nobody else can see them. And if you decide, oh, I'm aborting for some reason, you undo it. And it's not there. So this is not, this is. I revert all information in virtual memory to what it was before. It turns out in this case, it's freeing it. But I, the hardware, am completely unaware that I have done this pair of semantic actions. So, so the thing is that the memory allocator is actually in kernel, right? There must be lots of kernel. No, 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 no. I said user level math. Uh, S uh, yeah. allocates virtual memory for the So the process. data structures that organize the memory okay. with well, this is processing. Unfortunately, there's one variable that you can't change the user in address space and convert it points to the top of your usable memory. There's one variable that is changed by SPRIN in user address space. You better not change to the wrong value when you, when you roll back. Okay, well, we should take this offline. It, it currently works. Oh, well, I shouldn't say that. It works ba based on testing, right? Not SHAs like verification. Yeah. I haven't answered my question The current approach, which we haven't elegantly formalized yet, it's like it's like a timeout on the transaction. You just kind of say, just we're going to go into the system mode, and the system is not in the transaction. It doesn't, we certainly don't want the operating system blocking on some user level conflict. Uh, it just gets to manipulate its data structures. So you can swap out the processor state and put it in the processor state. Right. You know, I have to figure out exactly what the student is doing. <laughs> okay. So um, now, in contrast, like transactional, um, one of our underlying philosophies is that we don't we want to have an evolutionary solution that initially is completely user level, requires almost no changes to the operating system, and then later on, if the operating system wants to use transactions at the high level, just like operating systems like to use virtual memory at the high level, then they can think about it. But we're not, like TCC says, uh, redo everything, you know, and 
that's not our approach. So right now, that doesn't require very much of the operating system. You just have to be able to register this new type of conflict, and you have to vector the trap, which a lot of operating systems allow you to just install it. Okay. The future, however, is going to need some more things. One thing is, you know, these are pretty lame system calls. We like to have more powerful system calls that actually do something. And for that, we're going to need it's still to be worked out. The database community has this idea of, comp, of open transactions where you can register compensating actions. So if you sent out uh, you know, a letter to somebody that does this, the compensating action might be to um, send a correction. So it, it doesn't actually completely undo it bitwise at a low level, but somebody's saying at the high level that these are, that's an equivalent compensating action. So that's something to be looked at. Uh, the other thing that a couple of you were getting at is our story still is not very good for paging, uh, process switching, and migration. Because the you know, directories, for example, point to processors. They don't point to threads. And uh, currently, the ideas that we have for making this wonderful, and we have some, are like a lot of mechanism. And it's we're going to have to find out whether people really do want transactions that live this long, or are they just doing transactions because they want something a little better than a compare and swap. Um, but, and this, this means we're not out of work yet. So would you avoid a transaction if a compare swap occurred, or would you try to preserve states? So that well, one of the problems with our scheme, in all honesty, is so it would be nice to say that, you know, if you it would be a step forward to say, well, we can handle all this stuff, we just abort. So then we, we're safe, but there's you know, issues with forward progress. Uh, we're actually in worse shape than that because we can't just abort you because the old data is in the log. It actually takes work to put the new data, to put the old data back in place. Who's going to do that work, right? You know, operating system is not going to call, user, could you please undo your log and then get back to me? Um, so we have some ideas, none of which are very elegant yet. Okay, so um, let's see. Try to save people's time here. So we'll do a little bit of evaluations. Um, all right. So currently, this is uh, running. I guess the only thing that really matters is this is not on a CMP infrastructure yet. This is on a non-CMP. Think it, it's like an SMP except with a directory protocol. Thirty-two processors. Uh, using Virgitex Simix for full system function, we're actually running Solaris 9. And uh, then we have our own local stuff, which simulates all the memory hierarchy. And we can do, for example, we have a begin transaction instruction. And the way we do that is Simix lets you take special no ops and have them sort of trap into the simulator. And then we can you know, go change our transaction mode. OK. so. Here's a quickie micro benchmark. This is just um, incrementing a shared counter and doing a trivial amount of work. And we'll compare against uh, test and test and set with exponential back off and uh, MCS locks, software Q locks. All right, and what do we find? Oh, it's all good. <laughs> <coughs> so here's execution time. So down is good. Here's log TM, it's down. Uh, Exponential back off gets really bad when you get lots of threads uh, and, and MCS scales better, but the overhead is higher. And so you can conclude that for this trivial microbenchmark that LogTM performs better in part because it does not, doesn't even have to read and write the log. Uh, but this is also true of the other HTMs. And so one limit of this work, by the way, we, we haven't implemented the other, all the other solutions to compare against them because that's a ton of work. So that's a little caveat. Um, let me just let that one go. All right, so what about some more real things? These are not very real, but uh, these are the Splash 2 benchmarks. OK, and we have some numbers. OK, so this is uh, my student has flipped the sense here. So this is log TM speed up with respect to Parmax locks. So the, when the bars are higher, it means we're faster. So for ray trace optimize, we are four times faster. Now this is pretty good news because the whole one of the rationales for um, 
transactional memory was that it's simpler to program. We didn't actually promise that it was going to be faster, especially with respect to programs that where the locks have been optimized. But it, but it actually can be faster. Um, so first of all, why? Because it doesn't read and write the lock. Uh, and one of the things is that's kind of interesting is we, we can get this phenomenon called critical section parallelism. So if you're in a critical section protect, that was protected by lock L, you know, how many, if, if at least one is in there, how many tend to be in there? Well, if you're doing it with locks, we you know the answer. It's one. It's a critical section, right? Well, here we can actually have cases where multiple threads are in the same critical section because the lock has been removed and it's got this begin and end transaction. And you actually get work done because you're actually manipulating non-conflicting data. Uh, so ray trace opt got optimized so that our average critical section parallelism was 5.5. Yes? Do you think that's because you essentially changed it to a reader writer lock or because it's finer grain blocking? Um, well, that's a good question. So, finer grain is certainly a big part of it. What did I just do to myself? But that's a good question to look at if it's effectively a reader writer lock. Yes? So, so how did you actually change the priority? Just whenever there was a lock acquire release, you put the transaction around there? That's the, yeah, that was the initial start. And then the student had to optimize some. By making fine grain or I don't remember. Whatever. Okay. Um, what did I want to say? Uh, yeah, by the way, one problem with transactional memory is hardware transactional memory, to be in truth an advertisement here, is that if you have false sharing where you're you're not really sharing, but they have to be mapped to the same cache block. Transactional memory can make things worse than locks, because with locks, you get a little few extra cache misses on those cache blocks. Here, we can get sort of false conflicts that unroll the whole transaction. Yes? Remember how long these transactions were, in the number of cycles, or to the extent that you had overflows? Uh, no, we didn't have really any overflows. How long were there? I don't remember. But these are, if I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess this is less than 500 instructions, you know, often less than 100 instructions kind of thing. So this is not using transactions to go for a long, long time. Okay, so I'll try to finish here because I'll take you a long time. So here's a couple things. So first of all, these two columns, stalls plus aborts, tell you how often sort of we had a problem. And ignoring Barnes, you can see that most of the time, you know, uh, you didn't have a problem. Barnes had some issues. Uh, okay. Second thing is that uh, aborts, except for Barnes, are are co less common than stalls. So this notion of trying to stall, if you can, uh, seemed to make sense and help for these programs. And the third thing, this comes back to something that we talked about at the beginning, which is that for this data that was written in a transaction, how much was it read first? And the answer is, except for Barnes, I get rid of Barnes, um, a lot. And this actually has some real advantages. It reduces the overhead of our hardware solution. OK, so uh, yeah, it's promising. OK, so some of our future work is to try to replace our sort of naive abort policy with a real contention manager. And we actually now have sort of the mechanisms in place to trap to that, but we don't have any policies implemented. We certainly need to improve the virtualization, particularly um, if people are going to run these things long relative to time slices. Um, we're going to have to handle I.O. and nested transactions. Just flattening things is not acceptable. Um, and we got some good ideas there. Uh, and so I think I'll stop there. I won't bother with the other multifaceted stuff. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yep. I think with respect to overflow, the main thing that these programs are ignoring is that in most programs, most of the data is not shared, and that only little stuff is shared. And so most of the access is directed to the local data, which you won't need to waste any block space on or cache space on in terms of the bits that you're having. Right. So have you thought about that and how, how to incorporate sort of knowledge? Uh, <coughs> you 
<laughs> right, so the, the question was, um, there's a lot of data that could be manipulated in a transaction which somebody knows is actually private. And so if this was somehow communicated to the lower layers, then uh, the stuff wouldn't need bits, wouldn't have to be overflow, wouldn't be in a log, and all this other good stuff. OK, well, that's absolutely true. It's also true for coherence, by the way. If you knew that things were private, you wouldn't actually need the coherence protocol, of course, except if you migrated. Um, so it is definitely worth thinking about, because this is also something that the software transactional memory systems are very good at, because they know that you, know, you actually, in some cases, nothing is saved except the variables that you explicitly declare need to be transactionally saved. Um, so it's, that's an interesting thing. Now you might say, well, you're being particularly stupid. For example, all your stack references are going to get logged and things like that. Well, that's true. I actually don't think that's a big deal because you know you have a lot of stack locality. You only log it sort of once. Um, but it'd be really interesting. So what kind? Well, maybe we can talk offline. The hard part is communicating this this fact to the hardware, right? Because one of the features of our 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 system, by the way, is that if you call a library, the library can be written once. And sometimes it can be called within the transaction, and sometimes it can be called not in a transaction. And you don't need like different types of loads and stores depending on whether you're transactional. Hurley's scheme, for example, you had you had to do it differently. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks.